Hi, it's Dr. David Green, founder and CEO of R3 Stem Cell. Today's topic are the eight things that you should know about amniotic stem cell therapy. So let's jump right in. The first thing to know is what exactly is in amniotic fluid? Well, there's a lot of beneficial things in it. I mean, it is the substance that surrounds the baby and helps protect it. So one of the first things that you should realize that it has in it is it has a lot of growth factors. And these are things that are helping the baby to do just that, to grow. There's between 80 and 120 growth factors in amniotic fluid. So let me put this in perspective for you. Platelet-rich plasma therapy, known as PRP therapy, has about 7 growth factors involved. So when you multiply that by over 10, that's how many growth factors you get in amniotic fluid. So it's amazing how much it can help uh, repair and regenerate with those growth factors. The uh, you know, wounds that are not healing well, tendons that are torn, uh, injured ligaments, cartilage, things like that. Okay? Now it does also have antimicrobial factors in it. It helps to, the baby to prevent infection. And that's one of the reasons why there's a really low incidence of infection when you undergo amniotic stem cell therapy. So additional things that are in uh, amniotic fluid would be hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid is really the motor oil of what's in your joints. It helps to create that you know, frictionless surface to where the joints can rub up against each other and not cause pain and not break down so rapidly. So that's a very beneficial. And the last thing is stem cells. There are quite a few stem cells in amniotic fluid. Um, when you process that fluid, we'll talk about it in a little bit, what happens to those stem cells. All right, moving on. The second thing you should know about amniotic fluid is how do we obtain it to use in regenerative medicine? Well, some people are under the false claim that, that it's uh, being obtained through an amniocentesis. That's not, that's not done. An amniocentesis is a procedure with a long needle that goes into the area surrounding the baby and pulls amnio amniotic fluid out and tests it for various diseases. Well, first of all, um, there's a lot of times we don't need to do that test anymore because you can just get a lot of the information from a blood draw. But second of all, there's some risks associated with it, so that's not how the amniotic fluid is obtained. The way it's obtained is a woman who's undergoing a scheduled C-section can be consented and compensated, and that's where the amniotic fluid is obtained. C-section is performed, the baby's fine, the baby's born, and then the amniotic fluid and the placenta are normally discarded in a normal situation. But when the, with the consent, um, you know, the, the amniotic fluid and the placenta can be sterilely harvested with no ethical concerns whatsoever. All right, so then it's transported off to the FDA regulated lab and that's how it's obtained. Which brings me to number three, which how is it processed and then how is it stored? So the labs that process the fluid are regulated by the FDA. There's a litany of regulations that these tissue banks have to go through, um, including testing it for all kinds of diseases, uh, running it through all kinds of uh, standard processes to make sure uh, that it is fit to be utilized in humans. Now, on top of those regulations, the labs that we work with are um, credentialed by the Asso let's see, American Association of Tissue Banks, AATB, so they're certified by them. So that's a whole two uh, sets of regulations to protect uh, patients. Now, after it goes through all those processes, it's then put into a cryogenic freezer until it's ready to be uh, sent off for use. And those cryogenic freezers are anywhere between negative 42 and negative 80 some degrees Celsius. So it's really, really cold. So the fourth thing to discuss is the immunology here. People say, well, if you put amniotic fluid from, from uh, Betty into John, isn't there going to be some kind of a rejection reaction? The answer is no. It's an immunologically privileged material that can be applied either by injection or IV, and it doesn't cause a rejection reaction. We've been working with uh, clinics for years now, and we've never had an adverse reaction uh, significant of, of rejection. So it, it just doesn't happen. All right, moving on to uh, number five uh, and six together is sort of what are the applications how is it applied, and then what are the uses of it? Well, application-wise, it comes in a couple different formats. One is as a liquid, and that's what gets cryopreserved, and then uh, sent for use, and then thawed out. 
And then the, the second uh, way is as a membrane. So uh, the placenta uh, can be used to create this uh, membrane, and that membrane can be used for wound care. Uh, it's amazing for diabetic wounds that are having difficulty healing. I mean, it can help a wound heal that would never heal otherwise. Um, it can also be used in the eye for chemical burns and things like that to help it heal, but yet prevent scar tissue from forming. It can be used during surgery with an amniotic membrane to help a tendon or a ligament reconstruction uh, heal faster. And it can also be used um, for, uh, say, in spinal surgery to put around the spinal cord to pre help prevent scar tissue from forming. So those are the two, two uh, mediums that it comes in, either a fluid or the uh, amniotic membrane. There are some new ways that uh, uh, people are putting the fluid into um, an off-the-shelf ambient temperature. But what, what that does is it's called a lyophilized version, and all the cells are dead, but the growth factors still remain. So that's also in play as well. Now, when it gets shipped to the practice, it goes on dry ice, so it stays cryogenically frozen, and it's good for three to five days, you know, as long as the dry ice stays intact, um, and then it needs to be used. All right, so that's how it comes into the practice. It's thawed out for about five to ten minutes, and then it's uh, uh, injected or infused. Um, that's how it's, it's uh, applied. All right, so uh, moving on to uh, uh, more about the uses. So it's really good for degenerative conditions, whether it's due to arthritis, uh, degenerative arthritis, post-traumatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, any of those types of conditions, it does well in the joint. Now, it can help uh, promote cartilage regrowth. It can help uh, suppress inflammation and provide pain relief. It can help uh, um, tendons and ligaments restore, repair, and regenerate themselves. Um, so whether it's an arthritic joint or if it's a soft tissue condition, such as tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, rotator cuff bursitis, um, spinal arthritis, all of these, we've seen amazing outcomes over the last few years that we've been working with practices to the tune of uh, between 85 and 90 percent excellent outcomes. Okay, so all of those. And then we do have some physicians who are using it IV as well for any number of conditions, whether it's neurologic, whether it's uh, di uh, diabetes, uh, kidney failure, heart failure. Um, and we're getting some excellent results there as, as well. Uh, moving on to number seven, really, what are the benefits uh, of the material? Well, there are a lot of benefits. One is it's non-steroidal, so you can use it repetitively and you don't have any of the downsides of using um, steroid. And that's really the crux of the issue is that this is a regenerative material. Steroid does provide good pain relief in joints, but it doesn't repair anything. It's just a Band-Aid. So this is actually helping to repair your body. Another benefit is that it's a very, very low risk profile, very low incidence of infection, no rejection, um, doesn't really lead to any bleeding, you know, things like that. So uh, it's a very low risk profile. And the benefit is that what we've seen and what studies are starting to show um, in higher numbers is that it does provide a longer term benefit with a really low risk profile and it can help stave off the need for potentially risky surgery. It can help get athletes back on the field faster. It can help wounds heal that would never heal otherwise. And you know, if you have a diabetic ulcer, it can turn into an osteomyelitis, a bone infection that can then lead to sepsis. So it can help prevent those types of issues as well. The Eighth thing that you should know is, is it covered by insurance? We get this question every day, and the answer is typically it's not. So if it's used in conjunction with a spine surgery or a tendon or ligament reconstruction, then yes, it is. And it, it's usually coded out as what's called an allograft, meaning it's tissue from a human, but it's tissue from another human. Okay, so that is um, an insurance reimbursable uh, event. Now, but if it's a simple injection into a joint, then it's not covered by insurance right now. Now, your visit can be covered, your imaging studies, blood work, those types of things, absolutely. But when it comes to the injection material, it's usually not. And if someone tells you that it is, then 
I'd like to know what codes they might be using because um, if it's a legitimate attempt at coding, we just haven't seen reimbursement for it. Um, it's not to say it's not effective and it's not uh, uh, being done, you know, over 100,000 times in this country uh, to date, but it's just not being covered right now. All right, so visit us online at r3stemcell.com. You'll find a ton of educational information, more videos. There's a physician locator. Call us to get scheduled for a consultation at 844-GET-STEM. We'd be happy to help you, and I think you'll be happy with your results. Thank you.